River Point, it's good to be back. I want to take a moment to greet everybody watching online. What's up to everybody in Mo City, everybody in West End. Uh, you have to see a picture of my newborn son. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Roman Xander Leak. Ladies and gentlemen, my, my, older, my older son, oldest son, who's four and a half, we said, Jackson, what do you think that we should name your younger brother? He said, Spider-Man Leak. I said, son, we can't do that. That would be irresponsible. So we went with, went with Roman Xander. But I am glad to, to be back and super glad to be uh, studying this book of Galatians. I hope that you, um, throughout, throughout the week, you're reading Galatians for yourself and asking the Lord to, to speak to you. If you're here today and you're not a church person, uh, you're going to love Galatians because it's written by a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul. And the reason he's got credibility isn't just because he's in the Bible. In fact, Paul was a person that actually used to be against the movement of Christianity, so much so that he was in charge of killing Christians before he had an encounter with Jesus that flipped his world upside down. That's why everybody listened to Paul. If you were killing Christians and then all of a sudden you came up here and started preaching, we'd go, something must have happened to you to make you do that. And that's exactly what happened with the Apostle Paul. And so Patrick did a fantastic job. In case you missed last week, I encourage you to go back, listen to week one where he broke down Galatians chapter one. Today, um, I'll be diving into Galatians chapter two. And here is how we kick it off. Paul says this, God had given me a clear revelation. He's not saying, hey, I didn't get this from somebody else. This isn't secondhand information. I didn't hear this from one of the disciples. I heard this from God. Then I got this clear revelation to go and confer with the other apostles concerning the message of grace I was preaching to the non-Jewish people. Then it says, I spoke privately with those who were viewed as senior leaders of the church, I wanted to make certain that my labor and ministry for the Messiah had not been based on a false understanding of the gospel. Then he goes on to say, I met with them privately and confidentially because false brothers had been secretly smuggled into the church meetings. Now check this out. They were sent to spy on the wonderful liberty and freedom that we have in Jesus, the anointed one. Their agenda was to bring us back into the legalistic bondage of religion. But you must know that we did not submit to their religious shackles, not even for a moment, so that we might keep the gospel of grace unadulterated for you. So there was a, a group of people that were trying to make Christianity into more rules and regulations. I don't know if you've ever been around that person that makes uh, difficult things uh, sound easy. They're like, oh, you want to lose weight? Oh, no problem. Just work out six days a week and don't eat. You'll lose some weight. You're like, that's it? Okay, great. Okay. Like if someone says, hey, you know, you want to be a millionaire? All you got to do is uh, invest 90% of your money in the stocks. It'll eventually happen. You're like, oh, that's it. And then sometimes Christianity can feel the same way where someone's like, oh, you need peace. Just read your Bible all day. And then that'll be really hard to focus on those bills sitting on your kitchen table. It's like, no, like it, it can be a little bit more complicated than it seems. And what Paul is trying to explain to, to first century Christians is going, hey, we cannot make this thing about rules and regulations. We must remember that the basis of our belief system is founded on the revelation of the grace of God. He then goes on, to say this, no, you got to catch this. this is, you may have missed this. You may have read Galatians your entire life, but maybe you, you missed this part. It says, so they concluded that I was entrusted with taking the gospel to the non-Jewish people just as Peter was entrusted with taking it to the Jews. They're sitting in the meeting. They're going, you know what? Paul, it just seems like you kind of got your finger on the pulse of people that aren't Jewish, you know, sort of the, the outsiders. So how about we 
focus on the Jewish people and you take the rest of the world. You cool? Like, how in the world did this happen? Paul's going, that's okay. I'm going to go on as many missionary journeys as I need to to reach as many people as I possibly can because the world needs to know about this gospel of grace. He goes on to say, for the same God who anointed Peter to be an apostle to the Jews also anointed me as an apostle to those who are not Jewish. And then before that meeting concludes, he, they say this, they simply requested one thing of me, that I would remember the poor and needy, which was the burden I was already carrying in my heart. They're going, hey, in the midst of us trying to figure out who we should reach and who we shouldn't reach and who's going to kind of divvy up the plan here, hey, let's not forget the poor and needy in the midst of it. Now, Here's something interesting. Something interesting that you rarely see in the Bible is an awkward moment. Uh, Paul is getting ready to call Peter out on hypocrisy. It's kind of like being over at a friend's house and uh, you're, you're, they're married and they start arguing in front of you and you don't know what to do and you just want to instantly be in a Southwest commercial, want to get away, and you're just trying to figure out if I had $49 to not be in this room, I would give it. And so you're just like, it, it, it's one of those moments in Scripture you're going, you guys are like, you're Peter and you're Paul, like you guys are supposed to get along. You're kind of a big deal in this sacred book that we've been reading from for over 2,000 years. They're calling them out kind of like, um, I don't know how much you follow pop culture, but I don't know if you remember the Little Bow Wow Challenge. Now, let me explain to you how the Little Bow Wow Challenge works, okay? Uh, if they could put up this picture, I can better explain this to you. Um, and let's show what he put on Instagram that one time. Okay, so this is what Little Bow Wow put on Instagram, okay? He said, travel day, NYC Press, Run for the growing up hip hop. Let's go. I promise to bring y'all the hottest show ever, May 25th on At We TV. Okay, this is what he wrote. Now, you see that Mercedes there along with the private jet. Like, man, Lil Bow Wow got it going on. Well, what happens next is a guy posted on his Snapchat. So this guy, Lil Bow Wow, is on my flight to New York, but on Instagram, he posted a picture of a private jet caption traveling to New York today, SMH which means shaking my head. Lil Bow Wow, you own Southwest like the rest of us, and our bags fly free, just like yours, okay? Like, you don't get a discount. Your bags are not on that private jet, okay? So that created the Lil Bow Wow Challenge. So you can see this next picture. What people started doing is they said, all right, bless my new ride at the car wash. You can see <laughs> that this man's Range Rover is really just in his shower. It's a toy Range Rover, if you can't figure that out yet. That, that is the little Bow Wow Challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, um, like he got called out uh, in public. Ladies and gentlemen, you must understand the internet is undefeated. They ain't never going to lose, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is a little Bow Wow moment that we're about to see in Scripture. We're, we're going, man, it, I can't believe Peter would find himself in this position. And, and here's, here's what uh, Paul goes on to say. He says, but when Peter visited Antioch, he began to mislead the believers and caused them to stumble over his behavior. So I had to confront him to his face over what he was doing. And he says, he says he enjoyed being with not the non-Jewish believers who didn't keep the Jewish customs, eating his meals with them, up until the time the Jewish friends of James arrived from Jerusalem. When he saw them, he withdrew from his non-Jewish friends and separated himself from them acting like an Orthodox Jew, fearing how it would look to them if he ate with the non-Jewish believers. It goes on to say this, so when I realized they were acting inconsistently with the revelation of grace, I confronted Peter in front of everyone, He's saying this, you were born a Jew and yet you're chosen to disregard Jewish regulations and live like a Gentile? Why then do you force those who are not Jews to conform to the regulations of Judaism. Ladies and gentlemen, there's sort of this tension that I think that we can often have uh, when it comes to how we act around people that aren't followers of Christ versus how we act with people that are followers of Christ. You may act one way in church, you might act a different way when you go to work, and you're kind of trying to figure out, man, what is going to be my rhythm. Um, in Christendom, what we now know as the church, we have used language that we've pulled from the Bible, essentially, like Gentiles and Jews. Um, in other words, people view this as outsiders and, and insiders. And, and we use terms like lost and found or uh, 
unchurched and church, outsiders and insiders, or unbelievers and believers. And there's sort of these two camps. And great debate has been made over the past few decades as to what the weekend experience of church, who it should be for. Should it be to help people that are quote unquote lost become found? I've never heard anyone say, hey, did you know I'm a found person today? I've never heard that. But nevertheless, I've also never met anybody say, I'm a lost person. Nevertheless, we, we have these categories, okay? But should the church, should our weekend experience be catered to people to be able to become found, or should our weekend experience be uh, produced to help saints become better Christians? Uh, on one side, uh, you hear people go, man, I I'm so confused. Thanks for your Greek and Hebrew, but man, I don't know Greek and Hebrew, and I'm confused. And another person can hear Greek and Hebrew and go, man, that was deep. That was awesome. Uh, on one hand, a person could go, that was practical, but man, I need some meat, man. I need, I need to get fed, you know. And then on another person, they're just going, I, I, listen, man, I just, I need some peace. I'm, I'm just so anxious. I mean, they're going back and forth going, well, what kind of church is your church? Is it a meaty church? Am I going to get fed? Am I going to get some broccoli at your church? Am I going to get some steak? Okay, like what kind of church do you go to? But uh, the more time that I have been able to spend with both groups and um, throughout the week, I run a leadership development firm in Dallas, and I spend a lot of time in corporate America. And then most weekends, I'm, I'm spending time um, in churches. And it, it's very interesting that the language that we use inside is very foreign to people outside. I don't know the last time you walked the journey with somebody from going from lost to found, but the simple verbiage can sound a little crazy. Okay, just think about this for a second. Let's say... Um, I'm a lost person, okay, and I'm going to this journey to being found, okay? So I'm living in debauchery. You don't even know what debauchery means. It just sounds really, really bad, like you're doing some bad things, okay? But let's just say I'm living in debauchery. My grandma's praying for me to get saved, quote, unquote. A, a client of mine said to me the other day, somebody tried to save me the other day. I said, they did? Oh, I might try to save you too. Okay, so all right, so so I'm this I'm this person living in debauchery. My grandma's praying for me. Uh, a friend uh, invites me to breakfast. They trick me into going to church. They bring me here and get me a cinnamon roll. And they go, hey, come in, meet some friends of mine. And that, now you know they're stuck in this room. And then Patrick gives an awesome message. And I go, man, you know what? I should surrender my life to Christ. Like, man, that. That actually sounds better than me being in charge. And so, so I, I, I say, you know, I'm going to say this prayer. I'm going to come down to the front. I'm going to pray and, and surrender my life to Christ. And then, then I'm going to go, so, so what am I supposed to do next? We would say, you should get baptized. This is the next step. You're like, okay, so what is baptism? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to uh, drown you for about 10 seconds <laughs> out there in this tub, right? And um, it's symbolic, though, like you're leaving your old life behind to step in to a new life and a bunch of people do it. You get a T-shirt. It's great. And um, if you got a lot of sin in your life, we might hold you down a little bit longer. But don't worry. We'll eventually bring you back up. We'll dunk you twice if need be. Now, but, but that's, that's, that's what you do. You're like, OK, so I'm baptized and I got a T-shirt. This is great. Well, well, what do I do next? Then we say, all right, well, you know, you should get in a small group because, you know, all those friends you had you were doing debauchery with, you got to get rid of them because their bad influences on your life are not going to help you live. Friends are like elevators. They can take you up or they can take you down. You need new people in your life. Here are these small groups. You're like, okay, what's next? Well, you should start serving. You got to start hugging, bouncing babies, and you got to start helping around here. And you're like, okay, what's next? Now you got to give a little bit of change. Well, how much? Some of us give 10%. Some of us give about 0.5%. You choose what's going to be best for you. You're like, okay, well, what's next? And they go, well, have you been on a missions trip? Nope. Now you got to go to Wakanda and start digging wells for people. And you're like, what? Like, just have you thought about this journey in a long time? I mean, it's like, it, it just, when, when we, what are we asking people to really do? And so we're going, man, is our weekend experience going to be for lost or found people? But here is what I have discovered spending time, a great deal of time with what you would consider both parties is I've discovered that lost and found people both have marriage problems. I have discovered that outsiders and insiders both have debt. 
I, I have discovered that believers and uh, non-believers still struggle with mental illness. I have discovered that insiders and outsiders both struggle with addictions. I just can only imagine what our weekend experience would look like if we hung our hat on not how deep the message is, but if we hung our hat on the fact that this is a place for people that are simply in pain. Or better yet, how about this? This is a gathering for people that are in need of grace. And the reality is this. If we hung our hat on, man, what kind of church you go to, man? It's a church of people that just extend a lot of grace to insiders and outsiders. And in the process, I think we'd actually just reach a lot of people. Because when you first come in the door, it's interesting. The hallmark is this. Come just as you are. By the time you get to your mission trip, it's like, you better get it together. Okay? Like, if you showed up here today, like, completely lost, right? Like, you can come in a little hungover, but if you a usher, you can't come here hungover. <laughs> but le let's just say you did. Here's what you would do. You'd be out in the parking lot putting in as many breath mints as you possibly can and spraying cologne and trying to Get it together. It's like going to the doctor with a broken leg and going, hey, doctor, how are you doing today? <laughs> what? Man, what, 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 if, what if you've been on this side for a long time? Here, here's what I've discovered. <laughs> Is that lost and found people both need a lot of grace and that found people every now and then find themselves a little lost. The biggest difference is this. Found people claim to have an anchor for their soul, and I believe they do. What I love about people that are like lost, lost, they don't have they don't have ego yet in their spirituality. Like they can keep it real. Like you can ask them how they're doing, they're like, "Man, I think I'm about to lose my job." You're like, "Dang, that's crazy." But we have our drive-by check-ins at church. Think about it for a second. We walk past you. How you doing? How you doing? What are our real options? Good, great. Bless. Like, you can't keep it real on a drive-by. You know, how you doing? File chapter 11 this week. How about you? <laughs> Going to be divorced by the end of the week. Y'all good? <laughs> like, so what do we do? We just, let's just call a spade a spade. We just, well, we lie. We just Wear the mask. Some of you got in a fight on the way here with your spouse, but yet you had to pretend. Hey, Billy, what's good, man? Oh, we're great. <laughs> what if you're not? And you've been found a long time thinking to yourself, I should have known better. What do you need? You need the same thing <laughs> that anybody walking through the door needs. The grace of God. Here's, here's, here's a thought for you. Right? Just think about this. I'm, I'm going to read it twice. An insider is in no position to judge an outsider when the insider acts like an outsider when no other insider is watching. Okay? I'm going to say it one more time because you're smart. But I'm going to say it one more time. Okay? Just, just in case you didn't get it. Okay? An insider is in no position to judge an outsider when the insider acts like an outsider when no other insider is watching. And I don't care how long you've been saved, there's a little bit of an outsider in every single one of us. Sometimes we read about Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors. And we think to ourselves, man, we should do that a little bit more. I should invite my sinner neighbors over and for dinner. You know, maybe I should spend some more time with some sinners and tax collectors. Maybe I should take some sinners and tax collectors to dinner. But if you did that, you are not Jesus in that story. You would just be a sinner eating with a sinner <laughs> and the IRS. <laughs> because we're all in that boat, in that story, we are never Jesus. We are always the tax collector. We are always the sinner. We are always a person that is just in need of a bunch of grace. And the minute you think you don't need it, you've, you have really become lost. Let me ask you a question. 
What if we took the same amazing grace that we give to outsiders and applied it to one another? What if we were allowed to be hurting in the lobby? What if we walked a little bit slower and allowed people to just not be okay because we decided we were going to be a place of grace? That this would be a place where the amazing grace of God reigns and we just, I can't tell you how many people have called me and have had to confess something that they regret. Hey man, I cheated on my spouse. I can't tell you how many times that's been a person that is far from faith. I can't tell you how many times that's been a pastor. And here's what I've decided. I'm going to be the same person everywhere, and that's a person of grace. Because the get it together message leads us to this notion, and some of you have heard this, fake it till you make it. Put a smile on your face. I'd rather it be real. I'd rather your joy be real. I'd rather you actually get healed. I've never seen fake it till you make it in the Bible. So why would I ever teach you to do the same thing? No, I think you can be real, and I think you can experience what Paul has experienced, what I have experienced, what so many people have experienced. Because as long as you're faking it, you may not even put yourself in a position to even receive the grace of God. But when you come to him just as you are, even when you've been found a long time, you go, God, I, I, I don't have it today, all right? Great. Guess what's going to meet you right where you are? The grace of God. No one's exempt. Paul goes on to say this. He says, we know full well that we don't receive God's perfect righteousness as a reward for keeping the law, but by the faith of Jesus, the Messiah. His faithfulness, not ours, has saved us. And we have received God's perfect righteousness. Now, we know that God accepts no one by the keeping of religious laws. It goes on to say this, but because the Messiah lives in me, I have now died to the law's dominion over me so that I can live for God. My old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives for the nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine, for the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. So that is why I don't view God's grace as something minor or peripheral. For keeping the law could release God's righteousness to us, the anointed one would have died for nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've ever asked the question, what am I being saved from? Let me put it to you like this. Whenever you commit a crime, you have to either pay a fine or do time. Sometimes that fine is so steep, you have to pay for your sins. You have to pay for your crimes. We have all committed so many in life, that we cannot afford to bail ourselves out. We needed someone to step in and pay a price for us. There was a volunteer. His name was Jesus. He came to the earth, gave his life so that we could live free. That is what you call grace, ladies and gentlemen. That is not you getting what you deserve. That is getting what you did not deserve. And so now, our response to the grace of God isn't, man, I'm going to just do whatever I want, man. Thank God for grace. No, it's going, because of the grace I've received, I want to spend my life in response to it going, God, I thank you so much for your amazing grace. Ladies and gentlemen, I got pulled over a couple weeks. I was sweating bullets, okay? I'm sweating. I'm like, man, I don't know what's about to happen. I'm like, my wife's going to kill me. This is crazy. He comes to the door. He goes, hey, man, where are you off in a hurry to? I said, man, I'm going to the gym, man, just trying to get some cardio. Looks like you could use some cardio, too. Oh, no, I didn't say that. Okay, I wouldn't say that to the Pope. I ain't crazy, all right? And he said, hey, man, let me see your license registration. I said, okay, I handed it to him. He comes back, and uh, he comes back, and he gives me, you already know the rest of the story, a warning, okay? He gives me a warning. Now, can you imagine if me, after getting a warning, I said, well, if the police are just out here giving warnings, I might as well speed some more. 
No! I'm like, I'm going to slow down. And I'm, you, you way nicer to everybody after you got off with a warning, okay? You see people that you got beef with. You're like, man, come over here. Man, give me a hug, man. This is, this is crazy. Why? Because you were given, you didn't get what you deserved. I was speeding, ladies and gentlemen. I deserved a ticket. But I was given some grace. And because you're given something that you didn't deserve, you're going, man, man, maybe I should extend the same thing to other people in my world. This is what I truly believe with all of my heart. Grace allows us to make space for each other along with our flaws, strengths, views, and perspective. In light of what this amazing grace that we've been given, who in your life, and maybe you can discuss this at lunch, maybe you can discuss this at the dinner table with your family this week, and I want you to answer this question. Who in our world, who in your world do you need to give some grace to? Maybe it's the person sitting at the table that you're having the conversation with that you need to give the grace to. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe you're a teacher going, man, these kids, well, I tell you, give them a whole bunch of grace. I know I might be a little bit ahead of the curve right now, but ladies and gentlemen, 2020 is just around the corner and we're going to have another election. And can I just, can I just encourage us? to lead the way in just extending grace to people that don't believe what we believe or see things the way that we see things. You know what I find amazing? Is that Republicans and Democrats can go to the same church together and lift their hands and worship together. What do you call that? How is that even possible? The grace of God. Isn't it amazing that there's somebody sitting in your row that has a different opinion for you about your life. Isn't it amazing that there are people all around us that have differing, polarizing opinions about sexuality or immigration, yet we can all worship and sing together and be in the same small group? How is that possible? The grace of God. Because at some point in time in your life, someone made space for your flaws and your weaknesses and your perspectives. Can we be people that simply have conversations that are full of grace? He says, you know what? I, I'm not trying to get my agenda across. I'm just, I'm going to live with a little bit of grace. Why? Because, man, there's a God that let me off the hook, and he shouldn't have, but he did anyway, and paid for it himself. So, yeah, man, if I get, you may not see it the way that I see it, but, man, I want to hear you out. Man, what's your story? What's your perspective? Here is what I've learned about grace in the 32 years I've been on the planet. You don't have to agree with someone to love them unconditionally. I can still love you and listen to you and hear you at the same time to go, man, I know that you got a story and I've got one too. And I want to pause long enough and have a, a conversation that is full of grace. I know we're going to go into some places where there's going to be lots of arguments. I just hope and pray that we as believers, man, that we would lead the way to say, you know what? I want to live our life with grace. Who in your world needs some this week? Your whole week's going to be different. This one, over the next seven days, I just want you to give grace to whoever that person is that needs it the most, okay? And, and here's what you can even do. You can blame it on me. You could go, you know what? This week, I'm giving you some grace because this little skinny dude told me to give you some grace. But by Father's Day, it's a whole new day. Do you understand what I'm saying to you, okay? Give him a break just this week. Why? Because amazing grace has hit all of our lives in some way or another. And if you've never received amazing grace, I invite you to surrender your life to Jesus so you can get a front row seat for yourself to go. You mean it's paid for? Yeah, it is. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. They saved a wretch like me and like you. Father, I thank you so much for this amazing church. I pray that we would live our lives with amazing grace. I pray, God, that we would extend it to people that are difficult to extend it to. I pray that we would remember that we are a difficult person as well, that desperately needed your grace. We thank you for your grace. We never want to abuse it. We never want to take advantage of it. God, I pray that we would spend our lives living in response to, to getting something that we did not deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen.